My name is Pamela Scott. I'm your program director for the Wesley Historical Society, and welcome. Welcome to our program this afternoon. Um, before we introduce our speaker, I do want to mention our upcoming annual dinner. If you have not bought tickets, our treasurer is here, and she can take your money in the back. Our speaker for the annual dinner is the author of Murder and Mayhem in South County, and she is going to be speaking about an unusual mystery down in and she's going to explain more about it. And so welcome, Rebecca. Great. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for coming tonight. I know it's freezing out, and it's hard to get out of the house when it's like this. Um, but I did do this presentation a couple months ago at the library. I just wanted to see, to get a temperature, how many of you were there for that? Okay, so this is good because there will be a little bit of new information and um, you know, some of you that maybe missed that one um, will get to, to see what it was all about. Um, so here we are, this is up in White Rock and, and partially why I chose this site, um, the Pawtuck River, as um, a research project was because it spanned between two states. Um, it also had uh, you know, a lot of industrial uses during the 1800s, um, and it really didn't get a ton of information, or a ton of research or attention um, as rivers such as like the Blackstone River in Providence. Um, but there was still quite a bit of information here that I think you'll find really interesting. Um, so I'm kind of gonna start with the landscape. Um, I'm licensed landscape architect, so I tend to picture things on a broader uh, landscape scale first and then uh, dive into some of the um, industry that was happening, the canal, and then um, just a few thoughts on you know, what the river is like today. Um, and thank you to the Historical Society, um, the Babcock Smith House for hosting this, and the Westry Library Special <laughs> Collections gets a special plug here because um, while I did my, my degree was done at Harvard, I did the majority of all of my archival research down here in the special collections. Um, so that was super valuable. Um, okay. So, um, so partially why I'm interested in this site, a sole source aquifer means just that there's 60,000 people or residents in this area that are drinking water that comes in. So it's a very, it's a very valuable uh, source of drinking water. Um, and so any contamination that may have happened in the past or in the present is, is really relevant here. Um, and there's only 44 of them in the whole state. Um, the, what's also interesting about this area is that it's 75% uh, forested. And so that's usually really, really good, um, especially for water quality. Um, but what I'll kind of talk about is how that's changed over the years, um, gone from periods where it's been really great water quality to very, very poor water quality and starting to come up uh, more recently. Um, so here we are uh, in Westerly, um, Pocktuck, which I'll, I'll kind of refer to the, to the town as Westerly Pocktuck, just um, as the downtown bu business district. Uh, it's a 34 mile river. Um, the watershed is a sub drainage area of the Wood Pocktuck, which is one of the um, most undeveloped watersheds in um, in Northeast. Um, and then just a little bit about the geology. So what's interesting is that the, the glacial moraine that runs along the coast here um, has kind of created a barrier. So any water that falls on the like northern side of this uh, moraine will go into the Pawkatuck River. Um, so it, what it has done is it's really protected the salt ponds, which is you know, a really, there, there's a lot of information, a lot of research that's gone into keeping the salt ponds, um, you know, a valuable resource. And so that's mostly related to the geology, um, not really to the more recent uh, changes. Um, and so sandy, well-drained soils, this is up in the Girls Preserve. Um, you know, they're great for if you're draining any sort of pollutants. They're not so great if you're trying to farm. Um, so actually a lot of the stone walls that you see around here are from farmers that would come across rocks and put them in lines of walls. A lot of people think that stone walls 
were used as dividers for properties, which they were, but it was often more the case that they just came across so many rocks when they were trying to farm. Um, and so, you know, early on there was, there was fish in the river, there's like 1,400 rivers um, in, in this area of Rhode Island. Um, the salmon used to, is on the seal, so we know that there were salmon in the river. Um, and then a lot of the names that come from this area are related to fish or water or something that has to kind of, it's what I call a cultural landscape where um, it relates back to, to something previous. Um, so in 1660, um, this Narragansett chief Sosoa um, sold, which is, an, which is kind of an odd thing to do then, it was normally taken. Um, this was one of the rare occurrences where the, par the parcel was actually sold. So anything that was in modern day Westerly, um, this chief was actually compensated. This, if anybody knows the Pequot history on the other side um, in Connecticut, that's not what happened over there. Um, it was much less friendly um, relationship, but um, the original parcel for Westerly um, was given by a Narragansett chief to the um, to the the people that are on the deed at there at the bottom. It's a little hard to say. Um, and so in 1648, this is um, kind of the story that there's these two people that left the, near, um, the Newport Bay colony. They arrive at Mastuxet Brook, which is just south of um, Thompson's Cove today. Um, and so in all of the literature that I've read, um, it says it's marked by three juniper trees, a large rock, and a narrow channel. And if you go out there today, there's more than three juniper trees, but it's, it's a pretty obvious um, notation that seems to be very consistent for this spot. Um, that was a very narrow channel, um, and this was actually, I'll talk about a little bit later, where the estuary boundary was. So it was the head of the navigation. There was no, there was uh, where the salt water and fresh water mixed was at this point. Um, and so there's uh, Champlain's Wharf, which is now Thompson's Cove. That was the original town dock. So anything that had to be brought up to the village of Westerly or higher Potter Hill, Bradford, all had to be taken here and kind of shipped up on these flat bedded, um, their scows or they're called lighters um, because there were so many shoals in the river at this time. Um, so this kind of shows you where um, the they would bring up these lighters to, so they were hauled to like where the wharves are um, just south of uh, Main Street, where Beach Street and Main Street meet. Um, also called Bung Town, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and that area was generally between School Street and Beach Street at the very end uh, along Main. Um, so this Pawkatuck Bridge, I think most people know this was the original name of the westerly Pawkatuck downtown area. Um, this shot is looking towards Pawkatuck. Um, let me see if this, ah. So those uh, houses right there are right where the Bessie Inn uh, is today. Um, and this was the last of the wooden bridges. So this, this wooden bridge was last built in 1858. Um, and after that, they, you can see there's like a little plaque down there. It was rebuilt several times. Um, okay. Um, so some of the 18 or the 1700 villages, um, you know, I'm not going to go into all of these. There's a lot of history for each one that could take a whole presentation. Um, so I'm kind of going to focus on this section of the river from White Rock down to Champlain's Wharf. All right. So industry. Um, so a lot of what I'm interested in and part of my research was about um, industries that caused water quality issues on the river. So things like shipbuilding and grist mills, they weren't really that damaging to the river. They diverted flow, which as you'll see, if once you do that enough, it becomes, that can become an issue. But generally speaking, shipbuilding and grist mills, even sawmills where you're using a water wheel, they don't do a ton of damage. There's no wastewater coming into the river after they do any sort of processing. So. These were really kind of mellow industries, um, and for the most part, it stayed like this until the railroad came in. Um, and so the shipbuilders were using that transfer system I talked about, um, bringing up all of their cargo from down in Thompson, Thompson's Cove, um, up on these like kind of drift uh, to get up to the, 
the head of the river, um, but really not a ton of not a ton of industry going on right around then. Um, so this is I'll talk a little bit about this the tidal estuary and what it means. Um, so basically, 1614. This is really on an, it's not really being used. Um, the, besides the Native Americans that were using the river. Um, for fishing mostly, and they were using things like fishing weirs. They weren't using like any you know modern technologies that would have tainted the river in any way. Um, but and up until probably I'd say 17 or 1800, there was no there was no dredging or significant dredging um, that I found. Um, but as you know, today 2018, Broad Street Bridge is now the tidal estuary. So the salt water comes all the way up to the Broad Street Bridge, and that has a lot to do with the dredging. So back in 1614, Pawtuck Rock, that image I showed you earlier, um, that was the original estuary boundary. And it was a really narrow channel at that point. Um, and the water, it was also called Hell's Gate because the water was coming out so quickly there um, and flowing from upstream. Generally, the area right by the Broad Street Bridge, the water flowed pretty slowly, and so there wasn't a lot of drop there. So you can imagine that it took a lot of dredging to, to get it to where it is today. Um, this is just a map kind of showing you, um, this is a Sanborn map from um, 1886, and you can see in the middle of the river there's a bunch of these like islands, and if you look at the whole river, I didn't print the, um, the entire thing, but there's there are these shoals that essentially start right up here at the, at the bridge where we are today, and they go all the way down. And so it was really difficult to navigate this part of the river um, at that time. So the landing, uh, this is also what is called Bungtown for those of you who've read some of the Pendleton um, historical papers from the Historical Society. Um, this was the place where they were bringing the majority of the goods. So when I told you about Pawtuck Rock, where they had the, all of the cargo coming in, they were kind of dragging it up to this area, which was the landing, um, and this entire section basically up to the corner. Um, this is just right by the bridge restaurant. Uh, this is the Cottrell plant today. This entire section, outlined in yellow, was all wharves. So it was all not land, it was water with wharves over top of it. Um, and so why that's interesting is that this, if you look at this line here, that's 1890, that's where the water line was. This is the edge of the wharf. Essentially, the line of where the, the edge, of, um, edge of land now is this line in 2018. So, it's kind of like a land appropriation. They first built the wharves, they used the wharves for hundreds of years, and then those wharves then turned into land. So it's a way of like land filling um, by appropriating that for, for wharves. Um, so I can show you, um, let me see if I can go back more. Yeah, so this is a little, this is kind of exaggerated a tiny bit here. Um, but all of these, this section of the river used to be much wider than it is today. So all of the, um, all of the yellow areas used to be more water. All right. So 10 dams between Warden Pond and Westerly Village by 1900. Um, and this one I took last spring or last winter when I was um, doing this research. Um, which has now been, I think a lot of you may have been up there, that they've taken this entire dam out, uh, the Nature Conservancy, um, and has been reappropriating this so that you can now take a kayak, I believe, all the way down until you get to Potter Hill, and you get another dam. But the idea is that there, there, there were dams like this all along the river, and they impact the fish. Um, there's you know salmon that want to spawn upstream, can't do that when there's a dam. Um, We've tried to use things like fish ladders, but um, essentially it's, it's best when the river is flowing like in its natural state. Um, so there was actually a dam in Westerly. Um, it was just below where the bridge is today. You can see it here. You can kind of see it there in this photo um, from 1877. And the, idea, the dam was, I believe the dam was built early 17, 
1712, something like that. And it was, it was for the grist mill that originated in this spot. Um, this photo um, is one of the, this is a little difficult to see, but um, you've got Wilcox Park back here. You've got the Pocketuck Bridge. This is looking towards Westerly. Um, this is that old 1858 um, wooden bridge. So that was the old bridge. Um, and then this starts to get towards where um, the parking lot is for the bridge restaurant. So if that can, it kind of gives you an idea of where we're looking. Um, this in the middle here, you can see there's kind of an island that did exist for quite a long time. There was, it's called Alcorn's Island. Um, and at one point there was someone raising livestock on this island who basically appropriated that land because he got moved from someone else's and took over that as a spot to farm. So any, this is kind of very consistent with how people were then. Um, any piece of land was super valuable, especially if it was along the river or in the river. Um, and so you can see a lot of these buildings kind of hang over into the river. And once they come down, it's likely that they become land underneath. So it's, it's basically you're squeezing the river into a, a very tiny channel. Um, so what I'm really interested in is, you know, what were the type of industries along the river? And I talked a little bit about the shipbuilding um, and grist mills kind of being like low key industries that don't do a ton of, they don't do it, have a ton of wastewater. But once you start getting into these textile finishing, the dye houses, tanneries, um, and then slaughterhouses are the worst. Luckily, Westerly, as far as I know, and you guys, someone may know differently, I have not found any evidence that there was ever a slaughterhouse in Westerly that was disposing into the river. So that's good because that's, that's why the Blackstone River in Providence was so damaged because it, was, had, it had to do with a ton of um, pollution from slaughterhouses. Um, but I did find, you can look at the old uh, Sanborn maps, you see um, there's notations for dye houses, carding, weaving, spinning, so all these kind of you know, textile uh, related industries, wool drying, some of these do use, they did end up using, having a, quite a bit of wastewater um, going into the river. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit on this building. This was the stone mill um, along Main Street in Westerly. And it's approximately where the bridge restaurant is. So if you, you know, right, right at that south of the Broad Street Bridge. Um, and it was, uh, there used to be a grist mill there. Then there was this stone mill uh, built by the Pocketuck Manufacturing Company. By 1819, there were two tanneries. So it, it became more, more use over the years. Um, so, yes, yeah. so this is upstream. So that was Westerly. Um, that was the, the main industry going on Westerly. This is just upstream in Stillmanville. Um, and these buildings were likely the only ones that existed. Um, in like early 18, 1815, 1820. Um, so grist mills, some early woolen factories. Um, and then the similar, similar in White Rock. So I'm gonna kind of focus on these three, the White Rock, Stillmanville, and Westerly um, when I get into, so this is the next kind of topic um, is the, the 1827 canal proposal. Um, so I'm going to read you a little piece from this. Um, basically, there was a canal proposal that was put forth to the Rhode Island um, General Assembly by the owners of the White Rock Company up here. They also owned property down here in Westerly. Um, so just really briefly, the Pocktuck River, which washes the southwest boundary of the state, is navigable for vessels of up to 70 tons as far as Champlain's Wharf. So they were only able to get um, vessels of 70 tons to Champlain's Wharf, three miles from the sea and about five miles behind Boom Bridge of said river. Between said wharf and bridge are extensive water power, some of which were already employed for various purposes of manufacturing. And your petitioners and others interested in the property are laying the foundation for a much greater extension of application of said water power to the operation and machinery and contemplate to embrace their transactions, the manufacturing of heavy goods to a very considerable extent. So people were frustrated because they couldn't get goods up to where they needed to. Um, and so this proposal went through. Um, and the original proposal, which seems wild to me, 
was to start the canal up here at Boom Bridge and go all the way down to Champlain's Wharf. So in the end, they did not end up building that much, which is, I think, that would have really changed the landscape. Um, but they did end up, let's see it here, building a canal that started just north of um, the Stillman Avenue Bridge, so just north of the old macaroni factory where um, now Gray Cell Brewing is. Um, and it dug a canal all the way out um, towards Pierce Street and then back around and it dumped underneath the bridge into the mill, that stone mill that I showed you. Let me see if I, there it is, um, on Main Street. And so this was a, you know, 45,000 or 4,500 foot long channel. Um, it diverted quite a bit of water out of the river. Um, and some people were not very happy about that. So if you go back to this photo, we've got the Main Street Mill here, and we've got a mill situation going on here. So the owners of the Stillmanville Mill were not pleased that now the water was getting diverted right before it got to their mill. Um, so I'm going to read you a very brief um, piece from that. It was um, a case that ended up going um, between Stillman and the White Rock Manufacturing Company. Um, the, it's the, uh, to settle the merits, it will be necessary to ascertain first what are the rights property belonging to each of these parties contiguous to the Pawtuck River. The center of the river is the dividing line between the states of Connecticut and Rhode Island, the complainants owning the land on the Connecticut side. So these were the owners of the Connecticut Casting Company, which is um, off of Stillman Avenue, suing the owners of this mill down here who also owned the mill up in White Rock. Um, and so, let me see. They ended up telling them that that wasn't going to go through um, and that it was just too bad because they also owned the because they owned also the property on the Rhode Island side, they said that the, the injunction was that both sides were equally hurt by water being diverted before it got to the Stillman Bridge. Um, and so they built the canal anyway. Um, and so this is a photo um, kind of showing what that looks like. This is 1870, so this is actually right after the canal stopped being used. I have not been able to find any photos of the canal in use. If anybody has any ideas where I could find those, I'd be grateful. Um, but you've got you know, the Pawtuck River here, this driftway, which um, was also acted as a berm, and then the canal. You can barely see it right here along the edge. And this is looking uh, back towards um, High Street, right the, where the Save the Bay building is here, uh, the bean counter, I think there's a image of modern day, yes, so this is the same area. All right, and so because the same owners of the White Rock Company built this new canal that was now in Westerly, um, you can kind of assume that their profile was the same. So I, this is not of the exact canal that was built in Westerly, but this is the same canal that was built in White Rock by the same owner, so I'm kind of like interpolating here that it, it's about the same dimension. So 12 feet deep, 40 feet wide, um, and with like a 10 foot berm in the, in the middle. And so this is the one that still stands today up in White Rock. Um, you can kind of infer the same that this is what that canal would have looked like if it was still around today. All right, so there's a couple basins. This is coming from the 1877 view, but you can kind of see it. This is a Martin house with the Savoy books behind. There's a pretty big pond where the water was coming into. Um, there was a, this is the current condition. So this is behind, let me show you one more. This is behind um, the, the Martin House. Um, this is a new restaurant that just opened, which is very good. I'll give it my plug. We went there the other day. Um, this is, but this is, the, this is the area where that canal basin was. So if you look back um, on this map, this was an open water body. Um, and this is today. 
And then we have the industrial drive section of the canal, which um, is kind of runs along modern day industrial drive. You can see there, um, and there's the old canal. So it starts up here, comes all the way down like that. All right, so by 1867, the canal was abandoned, so it really didn't last very long. Um, it was uh, quite a bit of work, and I, when I think back to the idea that they wanted to do this from all the way at Boom Bridge and go all the way to Champlain's Wharf, they would have, it would have not been worth their time, obviously, um, because it, it really wasn't in use for very long. Um, just one note on this. I don't know if you guys can see this, but... Um, these are outhouses behind the, and they are right on the edge of the canal. And so you have to wonder what really did the canal become used for after it was abandoned. Um, and here's a lovely picture from a similar canal um, on the Shoko River in Philadelphia, um, which, which looks like kind of a, where all of your trash would go and, and everything else. So um, just to give you an idea of what that might have been like. Um, so by 1869, two years after the canal closed, they built this beautiful brick mill. And that's the mill that's kind of shown here. Um, unfortunately, these were all taken down in 1935. Very sad, um, because they're beautiful buildings. Um, but a lot of, you know, this, this was where the old canal kind of ran. So we kind of start building buildings on top of it. Um, let's see. And then the last remaining section, is this piece that's right along Industrial Drive. Um, you know, this was 1895, so it's the last remaining section. You can kind of see it, like, still, like, has been part, become part of a stream here and there. It, but this, I imagine, if I had to imagine what it looked like, it would be like a swampy, low area that was not really used for much during this time. Um, and eventually, it was filled by the uh, railroad um, when they built the new train station and the rail yard. So they basically pushed a ton of soil out the, the hill that um, is right behind. Um, let me see if I can show you a little bit better. This used to be quite a, a large hill, um, and they essentially took the top off of Marriott Hill and pushed it down um, to fill that canal. Right. Let's see. Um, and then, you know, there's Pierce's Brook, which also ran kind of in that same area of the canal. Um, as far as I understand, the, this, is, this is where it comes out. It's in this little square culvert um, right by uh, the Westerly, uh, the gas company that owned that property for quite a while. Um, it now is in this condition up here where it's kind of wardened off. Um, so we know that there's still some water flowing through that area, but it's all, it's all underground and, and in these culverts. Um, and then this is just an interesting proposal uh, that they were gonna try and subdivide that land that's behind, uh, if this is Pleasant Street, Pier Street going up the hill. Um, we've got the old canal kind of running here. They had actually proposed a gigantic um, neighborhood here, which I can just imagine how much that would have flooded um, because of where it is now. It's um, bought by Narragansett Electric and it's kind of this very like wet, soggy area um, behind Pleasant Street. Um, and then Industrial Drive was built over that canal site right around 1912. So the railroad came in, they filled the site, and then by 1929 we've got the New England Silk Mill, which is now the Johnny Cake Center. Um, see if I have a picture. Yep. Um, so this is Industrial Drive, and this area really flooded really badly during um, the 2010 flood. Um, you can see it here, all impervious. So we used to have, you know, a canal that was taking up a third of the river water. Now we have this. Um, and this is the, uh, the location of that basin that was shown on the earlier map, and that's the back parking lot of uh, Johnny Cake Center. You can kind of still see Marriott Hill, um, but this hill used to be m much bigger before it was kind of pushed down. Okay. So I'm almost done here. I just, Question, yeah. Would the canal strictly for water power diversion, or did they actually transport goods on the canal basin? They were transporting goods on the floaters, so nothing with a like rudder. It was just like it was basically like a you know a 
a barge that was going up the river. Um, yeah, I think it was, to be honest, uh, the ones that I've seen that are similar, there was somebody that stood in the front with a stick and was kind of pushing off the side, because this wasn't a very wide canal, and it, it wasn't very deep either. Um, I think when it was first used for water power, it was much deeper. There, the idea was that you know it would it would come down and then it would drop very quickly, and so it was kind of to try and to get more velocity. Um, but after that, it was used, I think, to transport goods and as kind of an open sewer. It's what it looked like um, from some. And the fact that they left it open and then filled it. It's very rare that you would not fill something that wasn't somehow polluted. Otherwise, they would have put it into some sort of uh, culvert and sent it back out into the river. So that's just my guess from, from the research I've done. Um, yeah, so eventually they did get around to dredging this river. Um, you can kind of see a steamboat right here in this picture. This is the, the bridge, this the, um, the brick mill that came down in 1935. Um, and starting in the, I'd in 18, well, 1856 was when they first started dredging, but eventually in the 1950s, the U.S. Army Corps came in and they took up the dredging operations. And they've, they've been kind of maintaining that channel. You'll, you'll hear local politics about this because there's a lot of moorings that are now stuck in the river and they're trying to um, maintain it as a navigation channel. So this kind of stuff still does <laughs> become relevant um, and then they also, in 1962, built this lovely um, flood barrier. Um, and this kind of shows you, you know, the edge of the water here. That was basically the edge of those docks that I showed you in the earlier photo. So not part of the river anymore, became dock, or became land, and now a wall. And then um, a little bit about the streams that were coming down from up here on the hill. Uh, where are we? Somewhere over here. Um, actually, we're right here, I think. Um, so here's the, here are the granite quarries, and there were several um, streams that were kind of running down the hill. Um, these were open streams at this point. Um, all of them, I believe, now have been piped, and there might, do I have a picture? Well, this is, this is one picture of of pipes coming out um, right behind, I think this is across from School Street. Um, but I'm just going to read you this quick um, piece on the area on Main Street. So um, Bung Town was defined on the edges by two brooks between School Street and Beach Street, which are now underground. Um, the area was consistently wet and muddy. Perry notes that tanning bark was often used for sidewalks during muddy seasons. This is corroborated by looking at the topography and the streams that flow from the east. And it can be inferred that this area became not a very prosperous spot to redevelop because of all of the water that was coming downhill. Um, in 1901, the street was paved with granite blocks, but by 1922, it was filled with ruts and obstructions. The appearance was more like a stone quarry dump. The riverfront usually shut down around December 1st due to ice cover and prior to steam power, ice skating was popular. So, you know, this, this area has changed quite a bit and the, this was also where the, the uh, wharves were on both sides of the river. Um, we've got a narrow, narrowed river in this area. We've got all of the water that was coming from the top of the hill, all in pipes. Um, so it's, it's really changed quite a bit. And this is, this, while this used to be the liveliest part of Westerly, it's now, you know, the most defunct. Um, and I think, you know, it's partially because it's a low spot, but also because there was so much more going on um, in, the, in the middle of town on, on High Street and um, Broad Street, so. Um, let's see. Um, so just a little bit about flooding um, these, these were fairly common. I mean, I don't, I want to be sure that you, no one walks away thinking that there wasn't flooding back then. There was quite a bit of flooding and it's, it's pretty consistent that when it floods in the spring, when the ground is frozen, there's nowhere for the water to go. Um, and so it can't sink into the ground and, and that's partially, um, the worst one that I found in history was February 1886. Um, and that destroyed, this is the corner of Liberty Street, looking up Route 2. Um, 
kind of near Evans Mobile. Um, and it seems like that 6 to 20 feet ranging of how much flood water, um, similar to what happened in 2010. So both were rain events that happened over and over and over on top of frozen ground. Um, this I've added in here just to you know, point out that we've come a really long way from there was a ton of uh, disease associated with water and pollution and, um, and generally in this, this timeline. Um, cholera was much bigger problem somewhere like Providence. Um, scarlet fever, there was actually a pretty large outbreak here. Um, consumption. Um, large amount and, and a lot of people attributed these to water even though there were so many other things that could have been causing um, you know these diseases it was often attributed to water and so it caused people to want to put water away underground to drain it away um, put it in pipes um, fill in canals standing water was not seen as something that was um, it was very desirable and unhealthy so it was more of a public health perspective um, and so this is today, and I, we want to be sure to say, you know, there's been a ton of improvements on this river, but the Narragansett Bay estuary takes on a ton of runoff that ends up in this area. And the blue dots here are showing point sources, which mean there's a pipe um, or there's an outlet somewhere along the river. So, you know, we've got a lot of that going on, but then there's new things like stormwater um, that it's just kind of running off, so the green dots are showing that. Um, so while we've made a ton of progress in, you know, keeping people healthy and making sure, like, we try and um, have clean water, um, there are still a lot of um, issues to work forward. So this is just my last slide. Um, why is it important to look at these waterways? Um, because today the only ones that you see are the ones that are on the surface. So the Pawtuck River is, is really one of the only points we have. There's a lot of small brooks and a lot of them are still shown on maps but they if you in fact go out to look for them you'll find that they're in a pipe um, and then you know surface rivers are often blamed for flooding events um, and so there becomes a lot of attention when there is an event like that um, so just keeping in mind that filling burying or engineering straightening them um, have have made these issues worse um, and that is it. I'm sure you can't read those, but those are all of my references that I didn't want to add to my, <laughs> to my slides. Um, but yeah, we can do a question and answer and I can go back to any of the slides that anybody is interested in. Right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, so I grew up um, in Groton, and then I went to school. Um, I'm trained as a landscape architect, so I practiced um, for about 10 years in New York, and the majority of what I was doing was uh, redesigning streets that were had needed improvements, mostly drainage improvements. So, um, and a lot of what I found was that we were we would dig up kind of what's been going on here a little bit with the drainage project where we would go to do a project and we would find that there was all kinds of stuff that wasn't mapped, um, that there was, you know, infrastructure pipes from like, you know, the very early 1900s up to, you know, more recent. Um, so that's kind of how I got interested in the topic. Um, and I, I really very interested in water quality, uh, this site specifically, because it on the, you will find that if you read the literature on Rhode Island, it's like given really high ratings for how great um, the, the water is and like how there's a lot of natural resources. Um, and I just found it interesting that there wasn't a ton of information that I could find on the textile industry here when it was such a big deal. Um, and so much more on the, uh, like I said, in Providence. Um, and not that to, you know, side say that that wasn't important, but there is also quite a bit of similar issues going on down here that are, you know, not as well known or documented. So. Um, you said there were 10 dams on Yeah, by 1900. Do you know how many are left? I believe that there's three left. Um, I'm not sure. I 
probably should look that up before I give you an answer, but um, I know that they just took out the Bradford one. There's the Potter Hill one is left. Uh, there's still one at Kenyon because it's still operating as a textile. Um, so yeah, I'd have to I'd have to look it up, but they're significantly less. They've been taking them out one by one. Do you know where the, uh, the stream came from? They went underneath the stone bridge in the park. And there was a stream to the middle of the park. Do you know where that? So, that yeah, it, I know generally just from looking at old maps that okay. it came from like the northwest or yeah, northeast corner of the park um, that came up from Tower Street. So it came down and then across. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thompson's Cove. I don't think so. I think Thompson's Cove is um, named after the so the owner, the family that bought that land right around. Um, it's it's right be, right above Massatucket Brook, if you know where that is. Um, and that that cove was was named after the family that lived there, but that also acted as the town dock. So that's where any of the big schooners that came in, that in the barges that were delivering any sort of manufacturing goods, they would stop there because they couldn't get up any farther than that. Well, that Thompson Corner, that was all water. My children used to ice skate. Oh, okay. And then they filled it all in, and now they're about four or five months ago. Oh, interesting. And I often wonder, do those people realize yeah. that it's not done to yeah, no, it's it's interesting. The part of the research I did was um, interviewing people that lived in the North End um, to see if they knew where the canal was, and the majority of them did not. Um, they knew of it and they had seen it on maps, but they didn't realize that um, one of the people I interviewed lived right on Pierce Street, um, and he had no idea that you know he his father had grown up in that house since like mid 1850s, and it just. He had no idea it was there. So I think there's a lot of that here. I think it's lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's, that's also part of why I picked the site because um, and to, I was interested in, I was interested in drinking water, but I was more interested in wastewater because I think to understand, you know, the quality of drinking water, you have to first understand what the, what was going into the water. Um, and so I haven't done a ton of research on that. It's also been a very hot topic, so it's <laughs> um, not something I'm sure I really want to get into, but it's really interesting. So. When I came in 1969, we were the second best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you know what the quality of the water is now in terms of swimming, etc.? Yeah, so the, um, let me see if I can go back to my map, yeah. Yeah, so what I n noticed was interesting about this, this is, this is showing like any water that, it's not saying that you can't swim in this water, it's just saying that there is some sort of impairment, whether it be fecal coliform or heavy metals or something in there. It, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't swim in it, but if you notice, there's like this whole section that kind of starts right after the Bradford uh, plant. So it's the, the river seems to be pretty clear right here. So all of the, any of the contamination appears to be on this bottom portion of the river. Um, and then Little Narragansett Bay, it's, it's just, it's difficult to get water out of there because of the way it's kind of the sandy point is blocking it from being able to flush out. Um, so it's different times of the year. This is definitely worse. This was data from 2014. So this is a little bit old now. Um, and the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management goes back and forth with um, doing these surveys. I think it's every couple years. Um, so they will be updating this again at some point. And that map, where is Thompson's Cove? It's right here, right there. Thompson's Cove, yeah. Let me see if there's a better one. How does that affect people as well? 
Um, I think it depends on like it's a, it depends on a lot of things. If um, you know the wells tend to be in areas that are not they're not in this downtown uh, region. So at most of the most of the people that would be most affected by any sort of groundwater are on um, are on public. Um, and then the wells are more. The, the problem with wells is you have to be careful with septic systems, um, and so making sure that people upgrade their septic systems timely, which doesn't always happen if you have an older house. So. Yeah, it isn't, uh, we're getting confused between surface waters and aquifers. Out yeah. Of the so. And you're getting those confused and tied together, and they're different. Yeah. So the this is showing. This is all surface water, surface. so this has nothing to do with your well. This is showing you like what the quality of water is. Yeah, in clarity needs to be made to everybody. Yeah. Big yeah. Yeah. Over the decades, we cover up the water. Yeah. Yeah, it's really difficult um, because I it's it's difficult because it's the the process of getting somebody to do the work. There's a lot of a lot of big firms, you know, they they need to find funding, the state, it's who gets to pay for it, right? So it's like usually the town, um, this is an interesting area because there's a state road running through the middle of it um, and it's two states. So we've got like multiple jurisdictions that, you know, feel that it's kind of gets back to that, um, the Stillman um, versus the White Rock company arg argument because it's like you know who's who's whose water is whose and um, so that aside I think you know it just it has to do with like what people want and if people understand that opening up you know a, a river that's been covered sometimes eliminates flooding because it's not piping it down you know um, if that connection can be made then then it can be really successful but it's really hard to to convince people of that so. Isn't it also, it's going to take property away. I mean, if you turn it into a stream, it run, runs right through my living room. Yes, in right some cases, for sure. Way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's there's quite a few that are, you know, piped that aren't really in, and I mean, like the, yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, it just depends on right where it is and who owns what and a lot it's of. It's downstream because if, yeah. if it's developed downstream, yeah. Uh, you know, it's all well and good upstream, but then you're going to have to dive down into a pipe again. Yeah, and I mean, it has, it's, it takes a lot of convincing. There used to be a stream that ran through Wilcox Park, and, um, and that became kind of like a public safety thing and like wanting it to not be an open, um, and so that's now in a pipe. But that was part of the original design by the landscape architect that was to have an open stream. Um, so it's, it does take some convincing and um, some places it might not be the best thing, um, so you kind of have to balance it. The Hell's Gate that you talked about, yeah. the sound of the was that actually like a small waterfall? Yeah, so water was pouring out of there. Um, one thing I'm not sure I mentioned was the, the upper Pawkatuck River, kind of where we are up here, was like really, really slow moving. So it, even today, like if you like peer over the bridge on the north side, of the Broad Street Bridge, like you can see like things floating down. There's not really any waves. It's like pretty slow moving river. Um, and it's been like that um, until they started dredging and doing kind of all this other um, work. But that area right at um, Pawkatuck Rock where the, um, the first settlers came, was a, that was a point where you couldn't get any farther up in a canoe because water was coming out. Sure. Um, let's see, find a better map. I don't know if I have one. Mm. Yeah, the water was, it basically it kept people from being able to get up in any sort of uh, canoe or um, sailboat. sailboat even that couldn't, gosh, I had a lot of slides, huh? Um, yeah, um, nope, <laughs> there we go, that's one I can use, 
Yeah, so it's right here. Um, there might have been. Yeah, so Champlin's Wharf or Thompson Cove, um, Thompson's Cove, kind of interchangeable, also called the town dock. Um, yeah, I think this is my estuary slide. Yeah, so you can see here the the difference. Um, it's several miles that changed from a tidal estuary. I mean, that also means like you know that whatever was living in the river at that time is no longer living in it because the river is completely changed once it got dredged. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's this one. Um, and it, it's still very narrow. I mean, if you look even, these are the old maps. This isn't that old, though. Um, but it's still like a pretty tight spot. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things. That, but during that time, there was also, you have to remember before the 38 hurricane, there was also Sandy Point was attached to, so that also kept the water from not being able to, to flush out. So. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the Westerly Yacht Club right here. Yep. That was the old landing. Yep. Yeah, my guess is they would like tie up here and then kind of go over. So bring their. A couple of years ago, somebody gave a talk that the depths of a lot of the river is just fresh water without any oxygen. Yeah, that's kind of gets back to the water quality photo I was showing. And that has a lot to do with just not being, it can't support fish, for instance. So, um, I mean, some fish, obviously, but not salmon. Um, so, and it, it would take quite a bit for it to get back to something like that. I'm not sure if it could be done. That's the hope is, yeah, because I mean, at this point, they, <coughs> they can't do anything. But if the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers continues to dredge the river, then they're also not going to, they don't like, salmon don't like to be in deep water. They like pretty shallow, um, especially when they're swimming upstream. So they'd kind of have to stop all of their like operations, dams, dredging, all that stuff for, yeah. Anyone else? Thank you guys for coming, I appreciate it. <laughs>